and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I am your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where we talk to the people behind the productivity, where you will learn not just about being more efficient and effective, but about doing work with meaning and purpose. This week, I get the privilege of talking with Paul Jarvis, and the best way I can intro him to you is to say, this is a great conversation about creativity, what work really is, how you decide when to work on one thing versus another, But before we get into that, I want to say thank you to Doodle for sponsoring this episode of Beyond the To-Do List. Doodle's an online scheduling tool that I use, and it's easy to schedule a meeting with one or more people. You don't need to register. You can just get started. To schedule a meeting, you just pick some dates and times that are available for you and then ask the people that are supposed to be at that meeting which ones work for them. Doodle does the work for you of showing you and picking for you which of those proposed meeting times everybody can be at, taking the headache out of scheduling these meetings. Trust me, this thing has saved me so much time, so much energy, so many headaches. And you don't just have to use it for business. They actually have personal scheduling profiles called Meet Me. A premium Doodle account is available starting at $39 per year and offers business users additional features such as calendar integration, automatic reminders, and more. I am one of the 24 million people using Doodle each month to save time and schedule a wide variety of events, and you can too. To get started, go over to beyondthetodolist.com slash doodle. Again, go to beyondthetodolist.com slash doodle. Well, this week, it is my privilege to talk with Paul Jarvis. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Good. So your name, uh, for a number of reasons, comes up with the, the whole idea of creativity, probably because that's the word creative is in one of your books. The, the Yeah, it's in one of my courses as well. <laughs> yes, true. Built out from that. And uh, I want to have a whole bunch of conversation. That, that just sounds horrible. But anyway, I'm not starting over. Um, <laughs> because that's what part of creativity is, is just leaving some of the, the bumps and warps, warps, warts in there. Jeez, really yes. going for it. <laughs> um, so you, you've got a lot of, of hats. That's kind of – that's what I know I you from is, is – and, and some of them I wasn't even aware of until I started doing my, my research. So I did know that you know, you've got this weekly uh, newsletter that comes out, which I enjoy. Um, you've got you – know, I, I follow you on Twitter, but uh, you, you've got you know, your courses, your books, but you're also doing like freelance design work and teaching freelancers how to be freelancers. And just all the – what are some of these other hats that you're – wearing well i'm also a podcaster myself so i have That's a podcast right. with jason zook called invisible office hours um also a touring musician although not touring right now and most <laughs> thinking about the last week the last week i spent more time in my garden than on my computer so i'm also i guess a gardener and uh, <laughs> a planter not quite a horticulturalist which would sound really cool but yeah, <laughs> just an avid gardener, I guess. What, what is the, where's the line between <clears throat> green thumb and gardener and horticulture, horticulturalist? That's... There may be a degree involved, or there may okay. just be a degree in your mind. <laughs> hey, if you've done your, you know, if you've done Malcolm Gladwell's however many hours in your garden, so mm-hmm. anyway. So that's a lot of hats, and and so, geez, a, t- a touring band. You're part of a band. In fact, you're actually part of a record label ownership as well, right? Yeah, we decided after we turned down enough record deals, we decided, hey, let's start our own record label because both uh, my wife and I, who are the band, know how to read contracts. She went to school for music business, and I just have dealt with contracts for twenty years. And after seeing record label contracts, I'm like eh, these all are awful. So. Yeah, we decided to start our own label just for just for the sake of our band, and it, it ended up working out really well. Now, is it just you and your wife, or there's other members at all that back you up? We are the writers and the core group, but then we also tour with people like drummers, violin players, upright bass players, hand drummers, all sorts of... The band grows and shrinks, almost like a collective, depending on the show we're playing or the tour we're doing, that sort of thing, but... Yeah, the the core of it and the the writers are myself and my wife Lisa. And the band is called Mojave. Mojave. Nice. Yes. So you've got you've got the musician thing. We're gonna come back to that. You've got web design. I didn't even mention that. 
<laughs> and that's the okay. Let's let's start there and dig in there for a little sure. bit. Sure. Because you have a unique schedule, I think. As some people think freelance and you just think, okay, cool. I'll, I take work when I can get it and then I try to get more clients and I just keep going and I just keep going and I just keep going. You don't do that. No, I have kind of <laughs> limited engagements with my with my web design because I've been doing it for – I think I just passed 17 years incorporated uh, last month in February, which is crazy. So the, almost old enough to vote. Exa- exactly. Yeah, and the corporations are kind of scary legal entities that exist as well, which is totally another conversation. But yeah, so the way that my web design stuff works is the, the, the way that I've set it up and the way that I position myself in the industry that I serve, I get booked easily. Like I get booked a lot and I get booked pretty far in advance. So I only really open my schedule up a few times a year. Kind of, it's almost like productized in that way, how some people like uh, like Marie Forleo's B-School is only open once a year. My web design services are only open for engagements like two, maybe three times a year, but mostly two times a year. And the reason that I do that is because I've won. I ha- there's too much, there's too many people that want to work with me, which is obviously a, an awesome problem to have. Yeah. But I... I typically when I'm working on stuff, whether it's my own products or web design, I want to focus on that. I don't want to do sales all the time. So I kind of block it up into like a couple weeks a year of doing business development and sales. And then the rest of the year, I'm free to just like do my thing. I'd rather just be making stuff anyways than talking to people on the phone about hiring me or working with me and that sort of thing. So yeah. it works out. So you've you've created – well, in one, in one way, you've created kind of a, a, a demand because you're mm-hmm. only open certain times of exactly. the year. And then two, you've created this space, this time and space where you're not doing uh, your, your web design. So you have the time for your own stuff, whether that's – now, I, I imagine that there's overlap there somewhat with maybe some of the music stuff, but maybe not. Yeah, I kind of like to do things uh, like one at a time, and I find that I can get more done in that regard if I kind of split it up. So typically, I'm only doing web design like six months a year, and then I'm making products for the other six months, or I'm playing music or doing something else. So I kind of like to to kind of chunk it off, and as well in that regard, I find I don't really get bored of things. Like I've been doing web design for, like I said, 17 years. If I was just doing that 12 months a year, every year, I would get bored. Like I'm a, I'm a creative, right? I like to use that word a lot. And I just kind of like I'm, I'm not good with doing the same thing all the time. So I find like at the end of a six-month web design stint, I'm getting kind of like, I don't even want to do web design right now. And then when I take a break from it for a while, I'm like, oh, I miss doing web design so much. I just need to be working with clients. I want to be make, helping other people do what they do better on the internet. So I kind of like oscillate back and forth. And I find that the way that I've set my schedule up really facilitates that. Well, and and it gives you that freedom because you then have opened yourself up to uh, um, being able to to fully focus. I mean, a a lot of people who are listening to this right now are maybe web designers, but they're also trying to write something or maybe also trying to do music, probably not trying to do all three like you, but (laughs) there are a lot of musician designers, though. (laughs) (laughs) but they are juggling all three at the same time. Like they're thinking, (laughs) okay, I've got my quote unquote day job where during the day or, you know, during peak time when other people need to contact them, they're available and they're working on the, the web design or, or fill in your blank here listener for what, mm. for, for, for what it is you do. And then they maybe have family or other things that go on for a while. And then either early morning or late at night or all of the above, they're working on that book or they're working on that other side project. And you've kind of just said, that's not the way I want to do it. Yeah, it was the way I did it in the beginning. Because I didn't know if like writing was going to pan out or if making courses were going to pan out or making my own turning my own side projects into like viable sources of income. I did do those things on the side for a little bit, but then as they started to flourish and kind of stand on their own two feet, as it were, I could <clears throat> more easily shift things around. So the first couple of years of writing when my book started to sell well, I was like, okay, I need to take 
like two months off this year to just focus on writing because the writing had made me money in the past that I could live off of for those few months. I don't like this. I like to keep my income split. So when I'm tracking money that I make, I track it by web design income, book and course income, like product income and music income. So I like to keep it separate because then I can see how each of those things are doing. And then when as as one thing starts to do well, then I can say like, okay, well, I banked some money for the product stuff so I can take time off and live off of that product income for a little while and work and let myself just work on products for so now set about 50, 50 because about half my income's products and half my income's web design right now. So I just kind of split it up 50, 50. At what point did you decide you're going to try and t- transition to doing that? Was it when you originally were starting to, um, you know, do the writing or, or what, what, what gave you the idea to try the experiment of, of structuring your time like this? Uh, as basically the very first book that I wrote, I figured that, and this was only I think about three years ago. I haven't been doing this very long. I've been doing web design forever, but I haven't been doing like writing and products for that long. So the first book that I did, I basically figured like, okay, if I'm going to have a go at this, this whole quote unquote writing thing, I'm going to see if this is a viable source of income. I probably would have done it anyways, but I just wanted to see like, Hey, can I make money off of this? So the first book I wrote and as well, I was do I like to do weird experiments with my life, which can work out really well or really badly. So the year that I wrote my first book, I had, I had concluded that I needed to see if I could not spend any money on anything but gas and food for an entire year. And the book that I was writing was a cookbook. And the plates and cutlery that my wife and I have aren't the prettiest. And we didn't have like fancy serving things. With a cookbook, everything needs to be plated nice and like laid out well and needed to build like a light box. So I basically traded and bartered and borrowed from everybody to make that book happen. Like I didn't spend a dime on that book because one, I didn't want to spend money on anything but food. So I could buy the groceries obviously to make the stuff. But I also didn't want to spend a lot of money getting my first book out there because I didn't know if writing was going to succeed. So I traded my editor for web design. I was friends with um, the head chef at a five-star restaurant in the uh, resort town that I lived in at the time. I traded the photographer food so she could eat the food that she was photographing nice. which is a which was a better deal on my end i <laughs> built the light box myself out of duct tape and bristol board so i i basically bootstrapped that book and spent i guess no i spent 12 dollars on the domain name i figured a digital purchase didn't really count towards because i was still spending money on hosting and that sort of thing so that didn't really count towards my experiment and then from there my second book I used all the money that I made from the first book for that. And then the third book, I used all the money that I made from the other two books. So I just kind of kept like funding myself as a writer based on previous releases that I, that I had. Oh, that's such an interesting way to, to do that. And, and of course, you're doing it independently because part of being creative is, is not having to owe somebody else a say in your work, right? Yeah. And I mean, I've been offered book deals too, which kind of look a lot like record deals where the artists just get screwed because they can't read contracts typically. So, and I'm sure there's, and I know some people who have book deals with like Penguin or big places. And in some cases it makes sense to go that way. I don't have a problem with big publishers. I just, because of what I do and what I like to do and the reason why I like writing, that's not something that I would ever want to consider. But for other people, it, it can work out really well. And I've seen people's careers catapult because they had like a big um, record dealer, a big publisher behind them. So at what point in, or did it already exist? When did the band come into play? Did it already exist or were you, did that come after the writing and this, this whole, Oh, this look, this is working. In other words, did the band become (laughs) an experiment that, that you tried after trying all these other writing experiments? No, that's existed for, I, I don't even know how long I've been. Well, I've been playing music since high school, which is probably like twenty years ago <laughs> now. Oh, wow. But yeah, so but then yeah, so that's been kind of going on the side, and as well like that, 
we ended up we were like actually making money, which is really weird for musicians <laughs> to <laughs> to do. Like our our tours were actually successful tours, and that was all us booking. It's good that I have a marketing background, yeah, because my wife would do all of like the booking and the dealing with the venues and all of that, which I don't like to do. And then I would take care of marketing and promotion, so I would get us on like local TV or local radio for every town that we hit to kind of like one, two punch it. And it ended up working out really well, but it was a lot of work. Like it is a lot of people think like, Oh, being a writer is hard work. It's like, no, try being an independent musician. (laughs) It is a lot of work. Yeah. Well, so, so to somebody who's listening right now and they're thinking, well, that's great. I mean, I'm glad it paid off. And, you know, I just don't know that I have a lot that I can barter to get like my first thing off the ground to maybe bank some of that. What would you say to them? Um, there's always things that people need that you might have. If you think it like that's the way the economy used to work, right? Like before currency. Yeah. Evil. <laughs> All of, I'll get, I'll, I won't get on a soapbox on that, but yeah. So I think there's always things to trade and there's always ways to kind of figure out how to make something work. And even if it's like, like you can get kind of tricky, right? Like you're trading another person who trades another person to make like a chain, although that can fairly easily fall apart. But the other thing is like you can, like I know a lot of people that have just like, especially for building side projects, they've built up enough capital from their full-time job to be able to bankroll a little bit of stuff. So to be able to hire a developer, if you're a designer to build that online product you want or to hire an editor to edit your book. So I know a lot of people that have done that where sometimes people think like, okay, well, I just need to quit my job and become a writer. It's like, you don't really have to do that. Like you can kind of take small steps and you can use the money that you're making currently to help kind of give that a push. Like I just happen to have skills that a lot of people, like everybody needs a web designer, right? So like my skills as a web designer come in really handy for trading people, especially other like writers or copy editors, because we both need something that the other does. So the the trade becomes really easy at that point. But if you don't have that, you can just like keep working at, at whatever you're doing. And I find as well, like from what I've heard, because I've never had a real job, but I've heard from people that have that have had real jobs. And they've told me that they they it becomes a lot easier to go to that job when you've got something else, kind of like in the mornings or the evenings that you're super stoked on and that you're working on. So yeah, I think it can it doesn't have to be like all or nothing. It can be small incremental steps. Yeah, I like that. That's one of the things I think that is maybe a fallacy out there is with all these people that say, "Oh, it's the entrepreneurial boom and you can you can follow your passion and all these other things." They <laughs> forget that it's not about, "Okay, create that one thing and then you strike, you know, you don't strike gold, you strike lots and lots of dirt." with specks of gold and gradually you melt that down and sell it or I don't know that metaphor is going nowhere, (laughs) but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Like it can be. And I find a lot of times success in, in however it is defined is that slow incremental growth, or it was 50,000 tiny little steps that you took that got you there. Like every overnight success is that person working 10 or 15 years behind the scenes doing something to lead them to that like big break. Somebody asked me about that. Like, what was your big break? It's like, my big break was working for 20 years. <laughs> I love like, that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh man. Yeah. I, I, well, and that's, I hear that from lots of people. I mean, there's people out there who are, I mean, people who've hit something and, or done something and you know, there's, there's this point where, yes, they've pushed the sled up the hill for so long. They get to the top, and yeah, then they get to slide a bit. But, yeah, they've still worked for so long. And you only saw them once they were visible enough to be near the top of the hill and visible, you know, out in public enough where you, they caught your attention and others' attention. But Exactly. Man. That's, especially with creativity, there's so much that happens behind the scenes in terms of, like, learning or trying and failing. Like, you only see, like, you go to a gallery, you're, you're looking at finished products. You're not seeing process. You see a website, you're looking at a finished product. You're not looking at the ugly, crazy stressful, insane process that it took to get to that point. So especially with creativity, I think it's kind of like, 
it's a little it's a bit of a weird pony because you people see the outcome not the input and so it makes people kind of think like oh well if i want to do something similar i need to just have everything shiny and perfect all the time and the process is always messy it's always going to get screwed up in some regard it's always going to be stressful at some point but it's just a matter of like perseverance and persistence a lot of the time Let's talk about a little bit about your process. I know that – so you've got, say, six months of freelance where, you, where you're open or, or different time. Is it six months or is it just six months all at once or is it intermittent? Um, it's pretty much intermittent. Well, so, you know, if you look at it in a calendar year, it's typically the beginning and the end. But if you look at it as a cycle, then it's about six months. And this varies too. Like this is just the last two years. It's kind of been a six and six. The year before it was probably more like three months of product and nine months of development. But because I keep my income streams totally separate, I can kind of gauge where I need to be the next year. So yeah, but it is typically like longer sprints. So I'll book a whole bunch of clients for six months and work on that. And then I'll, I'll figure out a whole bunch of products or things that I want to make or build on top of for six months and do that. Right. Yeah. Cause building out of say a course out of an existing book is Mm -hmm. a whole different animal of creativity than it was to just first create the book. Yeah. Courses are a lot. I was, I was like, courses are expensive. Like why are courses so expensive? Then I built one. I was like, ah, yeah. Okay. I see now I have to do writing and video and audio and Q and a and comments and onboarding and building the app. It's like, yeah, this is a lot of work. Yeah. So, (laughs) so then, uh, so you said uh, it was three and then nine, and now it's six and six. Is, mm-hmm. is the six and six going to be something you stick with for a while? Probably, just because I kind of like doing both things. Like a lot of people, because a lot of freelancers, they're, the holy grail is building a productized business and living off of their quote-unquote passive income from products. And I've kind of at that point where this qu- this is the first quarter that I've had where product sales have been more than my web design revenue, which is kind of interesting and kind of scary. But I don't, like for a lot of freelancers, I would be like, okay, I'm, I'm set now. Like I have a product that people buy. I don't need to do client work anymore. But the thing is with me, I actually like doing client work. Like I'm kind of in a place where I've positioned myself in such a way that I get the clients that I actually like to work with. I'm working on projects that I like. I'm working with people that I like and I enjoy it. Whereas a lot of freelancers are like, oh, my clients are so stupid. They always ask for the logo bigger or something like that. It's just like, you're just, your clients aren't dumb. You're just not teaching them properly. So, and that's actually why I made the course that I did for freelancers and why I made a few things for freelancers. Cause it's like, if you just understood a couple key things then you'd probably actually enjoy freelancing a lot more. And I think it's just because I've done it for so long. Like a lot of freelancers are new or they've been doing it for a few years. And whereas like I've been doing it like more than half of my life now. Yeah. It, you've been a career freelancer. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I, yeah, I always want to, I always want to keep doing websites as far as i know like for right now i have no plans to stop um yeah doing that and i kind of like the the half and half split is where it's working for me and my sanity <laughs> or, or almost sanity so yeah so i love the fact that you get to do in all in a sense you're doing your your dream job two different ways and mm-hmm. they continue to be refreshing and not you know stale or oh my gosh or at least you by the time you get to that point you're you're ready to finish the project and you get to move on to something new and yeah keep the rotation going i guess so yeah how then do you decide how, how do you collectively decide okay here's here are the things i'm going to make during my making time and here and uh you know how do how do you approach starting and and completing in that time frame like what if for example, what if you decide – well, answer that first. I've got follow-up questions. Keep going. <laughs> okay, okay. So, the, so, uh, so I use three things to determine what my next thing is. And people ask me this a lot. Like, I think anybody that makes stuff gets asked this a lot. Like, how did you decide what to make? Because it's a valid question because I know so many people who are like, I have all these ideas. I don't know what to make. Or I, I have no ideas and I want to make something. So I look at three things and it's pretty easy things. So the first thing is – Me, do I want to make this thing? And then the second thing is them, the audience. Is this for an audience that I actually like dealing with? 
And then the third thing is, does this audience have the money to buy that thing that I want to make? So, and that la- I'll talk to that last point first. It's like, and a lot of people have come to me because I am a musician. They're like, oh, I want to make this like cool app for indie bands that's like 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month. And I'm like, okay, that, that's cool. I'm not going to discourage anybody from making something that they're passionate about. But it's like, musicians have money for two things and not very much money at that. Beer <laughs> and gear. Nice. So unless you're selling them guitar strings or drumsticks or Bud Light or PBRs, they're not like they don't have the money. They don't have the the income to support those things. So when I'm looking at um, audience and what I'm trying to make that's a value, it's like, okay, do the people that I'm trying to make this for have the money to to buy it? And is it going to stretch them too thin? I don't want to. I would want to stretch somebody too thin. That would be kind of a like a slimy thing to do. And then the other two points, like, is this something I'm stoked on? Because if I'm not stoked on it, I'm going to build it and then just not want to deal with it. Right. So, or I'm going to build it and then not want the audience that it is. It's like the reason why I haven't really written anything specifically for web designers. It's like, I don't want to deal with web designers. It's just like, I am a web designer. They're (laughs) a bunch of jerks. Like, we're such a picky lot of people that it's just like, that's not an audience I would want to serve. So I, I don't want to build a product for that one. But when I think of freelancers, and yes, web designers kind of fall into that, it's like I don't want to talk specifically about web design to web designers who are freelancers. But freelancers is something that I'm super, super passionate about. But it's also a, an audience that I actually want to serve. Like I, I actually want people who freelance to be able to do better at freelancing and to not hate their job because they quit some other job because they hated it only to start their own job that they now hate. So I want them to break that cycle of like not being stoked on the work that they're doing. And freelancers tend to have a little bit of income as well to buy products, like whether it's a book or a course or something like that. So it kind of hits on all three things. So that's really what I look for when I'm building something. So then just say you've decided to build something, build something, and you, you're, you're chugging along on it. You're, you're putting in the time and it's coming along great. But then you realize maybe there's a change in the the vision or or whatever. How do you, you know, how do you course correct on something that you're creating and find out what it really is? And do you take into consideration the other things that you're still wanting to make with the time you've set up for that? Yeah, I'm. I guess the, the biggest thing for me is that. I have no darlings. Like there's there's nothing precious about my work. So if it needs to change. It's going to change. So, and I, I think I find a lot of times, especially like artists in that, get so caught up in how precious their work is that they're adverse to wanting it to change, even if it needs to, even if it's, even if it's screaming at them that it needs to change. So, don't really get caught up in like all of the work that I do in my own mind is okay to be different or to just die. Like if it's not going to work, it's. I'm just going to kill it. <laughs> so I'm like a product sociopath, basically. Yeah. Well, if, it, and, if it doesn't work, it's dead. Yeah, and, and that, that's the thing is like I, I've heard musicians say, you know, my songs are like my children. But the thing is, is nobody has, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids in a lifetime. And no, that's not what you even want to do is make tough. stuff your whole life, not three kids. Yeah, ex- exactly. And I think the the other thing is that I'm constantly testing the ideas that I have. So when I'm starting it, because most of the products that I launch are, are content driven, whether they're they're books or email courses or or full courses, they're content driven. So in the beginning, I'm before I start making anything, I'm doing research into the audience about looking for cues that relate to what motivates them, what their pain, this is like marketing 101, right? Like what motivates them, what their pain points are, and the words that they use to describe those two things. And then if I have the skill to solve those things, then it's like, okay, this this can be a product. And then I kind of get like the research aspect of it done. And then as I start to write it, I start to run it by my editing team. And my editing team are two uh, super, super intelligent women, um, Ashley and Sherry. And they both are totally okay with calling me on any crap that I write. Like if it's not good enough, they're going to tell me. And I would rather them tell me 
than thousands of other people who have paid for something telling me that. So they're, they're pretty relentless and ruthless in the best way. And again, I'm, I'm not like nothing that I make is too precious to not change or to be killed. So if it needs to happen, if either of those two things need to happen, that's okay. Then I test it in a small, I'm such an iteration guy. Like everything that I do has to be iterated on. So if I'm writing a book then, and it goes through the editing process, then I have some beta readers read it and I get feedback. Then I have more beta readers read it and then I get feedback. And then I launch it to a little bit of my list and get feedback. Then I launch it to my whole list. Same with the course. I think I had about 50 students using the course before I actually launched it publicly because I wanted to test everything. I wanted to see if what I thought would work would work. And if it wasn't working, then course correct before it went out to a a wider audience. Yeah, that's great. Uh, So do do you feel that you have to have marketing (laughs) or to be creative or is that actually, that's something you could barter to somebody, your creativity to somebody who is a marketer. Yeah, exactly. So, so <clears throat> yeah, I, I answered my own question. Make, yeah, but marketing does actually help. Like, it's not enough to build something now. You have to build something and promote it. And a lot of artsy fartsy types and creatives are like, oh, well, marketing or sales seems slimy or it's not me. And it's just like, that's just because you're not doing it in a way that works for you. And especially when I was starting out with products and writing books and stuff, I would read all of these like, expert advice on how to promote your book and market your book. And it all sounded wrong. Like it it all sounded like stuff I didn't even want to do. So I didn't do it. So I just did my own stuff instead. And it's just like the way that Gary V markets his books and sells his books works perfectly for him because he's Gary V. If I tried to do that, it it wouldn't work for me because I'm so different from him and he's a smart guy and he's an awesome guy, but our personalities and the way we work are so different that what works for somebody, it's just like if, um, What's his name? Tim Ferriss. Yeah. If he writes an article about like how to promote your book, it's like obviously that's going to work for you. You're Tim Ferriss. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's like it doesn't matter. You're Tim, you built an audience and you spent a lot of time building an audience that whatever you release is going to do well. It, some things may do better than other things, but the way that you do things is so tuned in to the way that you work and the way that you authentically promote yourself that it's going to work. So I think for a lot of creatives, it's just a matter of, for marketing, marketing is all about communication and talking to people. So figuring out the way that you do that, that resonates with you and that isn't going to get bored for you is going to be the best way to do it. That's kind of the way I found, like, the way that I pitch my stuff is very different from other people because it's the way that I pitch my stuff. Somebody else will do it totally differently, and that could work for them. So for a lot of creatives, especially if they're starting out, it's just a matter of figuring out what it is that makes it theirs and makes it work for them and makes it interesting to them to keep doing. Well, and you're even – that makes me think of two things. One, you're even approaching your what should I make process with a truer – a more true or a better and, – and in fact, what marketing should be kind of a, a mindset where you're trying to find out – okay, what are the things that people need and do I want to deal with them and can I create something that, that helps them instead of here's our thing, here's, now here's why you need it, you know? Yeah, and, but it, it works and it's, it's like the way that I write sales pages, it's such a hack way to do it, but it works. So even with like a sales page, I write my sales pages based on people telling me, like say it's for a book. I'll get my beta readers to tell me about the book that they just wrote, that I, that I wrote, that they just read. <laughs> and I'll take cues from what they said and use that on my sales page. And that's really how my sales pages get written, is I just listen to my audience tell me about that thing I just made that they just consumed. And that, to me, always works out the best. And one, I don't have to do as much work because I'm lazy, so it works out totally good. And this is why I write books in the first place. Because if I've had to tell people the same things over and over again, it's just like, I'm just going to put in a book. Then all I need to do is like, here's the book. Just read this. You wanted to know, about, this is why I wrote a book about vegan cooking. I was getting like dozens of emails like, hey, give me a recipe for this. It's like, nah, I'm just going to write a book. Here's a book. There's your recipe. Here, so I got sick a bunch of, writing, of recipes. How about that? Yeah, exactly. I got sick of writing the emails for that. So the sales pages are really written based on just me listening to my audience. And it works out well because it's... So from a marketing perspective, it works out well because a lot of times people who make something are experts in what they just made. And they use very different language than the audience that they're trying to serve. 
but an audience isn't going to buy anything unless they feel like they are understood. So if you use language that your audience is already using on the sales page for them, then they're going to be like, this is me. I get this. Like I, I believe in this. I, I can get behind this. And then they're going to open up their wallets or their PayPal accounts. Yeah. Well, so speaking of wallets, and, and you mentioned Tim Ferriss, the other thing I thought of when you said that, said his name was, there's this other fallacy I think of that when people who are, are freelancers or in do independent creative work, I guess is the best way to put it, mm-hmm. that they don't have to worry about money because they made so much off their last couple things they did. And so it doesn't really matter. But you've specifically, you know, in other words, you've, you've optimized your lifestyle to do the experiments that you want to do by deciding what lifestyle it is, uh, not lifestyle. What's the word? Um, the the style to which I am accustomed of living. What? That's the joke that goes. Yeah, with it. you know yeah, what I mean. I think, yeah, I think lifestyle is the right word. Yeah, and um, yeah, Austin Cleon Cleon just posted a uh, blog post about that. It's like the 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 number one thing if you're going to be an artist is to live under your means. That's it. That you've decided at what what your means are, and yeah. that you can live at or below that, so that you don't have to, you know, feel the pressure to have to upgrade your your phone or this or that or whatever every time because stuff works. Yeah, and the, the the biggest the biggest thing with like with having a lifestyle like that is like the the less money you spend, the less money you have to make. Right, <laughs> and it just it kind of makes sense. And I and I wrote an article about this, like how to be rich like me. I think I called it because I'm a sarcastic little guy. <laughs> and yeah, it's just like people are like, oh, because I, I heard this comment a lot from people, like, oh, well, I'm not rich like you. I can't like take time off. It's just like, wait a minute, I'm not even, I'm not rich like me either. <laughs> like I drive a I drive an older hatchback, and I live in the middle of nowhere where it costs less than the condo that I used to own in a big city. And it's like the the more that I can kind of make uh, like save money and not spend money, the less money I have to make. So I don't have to work as much and I can have more freedom to do what I want to do. And if I want to take time off from products and from web design, I can do that because I'm not spending a lot of money. Yeah. And I, yeah, there's a fallacy. Like you're just going to be like sitting on a beach with your laptop and which I don't even understand. You get sand in your laptop. And you can't see because of the sun. <laughs> exactly. Like the screen. They, they don't that like not even Macs have good enough screens to sit out. I wish I could sit outside. Even in the shade, it's kind of hard to see. Yeah. Even if you got like a palm tree or you're like holding a cerveza like over the screen, blocking the sun out, it's still really hard to see. You still kind of have to work inside. Yeah, I mean, you, the logic is sound. If hmm. we are working, yes, we work for money. I, we get yeah. that. We have to do that. But we also want to work for fulfillment. And sometimes that's the part that gets the trade-off where we end up doing work we don't love and aren't fulfilled from because we have to make enough money. But we've bought into this – what you know? we've bought into another fallacy of how much is enough. And so if you go back to the root and you're just like, well, no, here's what I absolutely need to make. So then I don't have to do – I don't have to make as much. Then I can do more of the rewarding work and – there you go. You 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 fixed the the math problem at its root. Yeah, and I think the whole even the whole I don't know. I just have I have problems with a lot of people who are like, well, it needs to be like the the work that I'm like driven to do and motivated to do. And it's such like a bougie like fallacy. Like <laughs> it's called. And I, t- I told my wife this jokingly a few times. Like it's called work and not super happy fun time because a lot of times it's, it is work. Like I don't sit like. We're at my desk, like with rainbows and unicorns shooting out my ass, like happy all the time about the work I'm doing. Sometimes it's hard. I still like the work, but it it is still work. Like if I didn't, if I somehow had like billions of dollars in my bank account, I would probably be like not doing that as much. I I may, I probably still be writing a bit, but like I wouldn't be doing it as much. Like it's still, it's still work. It doesn't have to be like soul fulfilling like obviously it should the work you do shouldn't just like crush you as a human being but it doesn't have to be like the most like you haven't failed if your work isn't fulfilling you to the core like other things do that like being out in the garden does that hanging out with your loved ones or your pets totally does that work doesn't have to do that i think it's like a millennial thing too and i think because i'm a curmudgeon old man (laughs) i kind of have a different view on things sorry millennials 
the butt of so many of my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that you called yourself the old man of the internet when you were talking on uh, Productivityist yeah. with, with Mike Vardy. Um, where was, there was a point – oh, the, the quote that drives me crazy – is something I'm paraphrasing it, but it's something along the lines of if people can't tell if you're playing or working, you're doing one of them wrong. And I'm like, Ugh, yeah. work, work should feel like work sometimes. I'm sorry. And play should sometimes have nothing to do with work. Let's stop trying to blur these lines so badly, you know? Exactly. Because it ultimately makes people feel bad about themselves. Yeah. Because I don't think I don't think that's the case for anybody. Like, oh, well, I can't tell if I'm working or playing. It's like you're just. Yeah, I don't know. It just it's just to make other people feel bad, which I think is awful. You should feel good about hard work that you've completed. Let's put it that way. Exactly. It's just like working in the garden. Like I planted I think about 15 or 16 trees on my property in the last week. It was hard work. Like my back and arms hurt after doing it. It wasn't like the I wasn't like, oh my god, this is so fun, smiling and like digging and whistling and stuff. There were a lot of rocks. I live in a very rocky place just under the soil. It was hard work. It was good work. Like I felt like I accomplished something at the end of it, but it's like doing it. It's like, would I rather be sitting having a beer in a hammock or digging this hole and sweating? It's like, ah, but I still like I still wanted to do that. Like I still wanted to put in the hard work so I would have more trees, which is yeah. silly because they live ultimately, in a rainforest. It's full of trees. A rainforest. <laughs> I, can, I didn't know Can- Canada. That's not the word. Canada had rainforests. Yeah, I live in the uh, a temperate rainforest. It, it. I don't even know what the conversion. I don't even know what it is in your Fahrenheit. But it's we don't get snow where I live in the winter. It's I was out in a t shirt working all week last week. It's sunny and warm all week. It was if there are any Canadians listening, it was about sixteen, seventeen degrees most days in the sun. I don't know what that is, an American. <laughs> it's probably 50s, 60s, something like that. Yeah, but yeah, it's never it's never cold here, which is why I like to live where I live. Well, I, I think the answer to what you just said was, would you rather be digging the whole – would you rather be planting those trees or would you rather be in a hammock with a beer? Yeah. It, it's, it's actually C, you'd rather have planted the trees and then be laying in the hammock with the beer. Oh, dude, beer after hard work tastes so much better. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Like there's something about that, the yeah. not the laziness and not the just working, but having both those things. So Exactly. Trees and gosh. beer. There you go. Trees and beer. <laughs> Which sounds anyway. Um we haven't even talked about your podcast. What the heck is an invisible office hour and why should we listen? And <gasps> season two is how far in now? Uh I think we're on episode eight. Okay. Or nine. So Invisible Office Hours is basically just like Jason Zook and I. He's the Jason Sadler, Jason Headsets.com, Jason SurferApp.com. He's the I Wear Your Shirt guy who then sold his last name a few right. times. Yeah. One of the coolest guys I know. That's why I have a podcast with him. That's why I build him. He's like my internet boyfriend, basically. <laughs> we, build, we build so many products together. And we do so many things together. He's a great guy. So Invisible You're Office Hours. You're for friendship. <laughs> Exactly. Shush. Okay, go ahead. So, yeah. So, uh, Invisible Office Hours is basically because, like, we don't, like, neither of us have an office. Most of the people that we know don't, like, lit- technically have an office. Like, yeah, we have, like, a room in our house. Like, the, the room in my house is more a rat pen, and then my little desk is kind of pushed into the corner. So, we, we, we kind of have offices, but we just kind of work from wherever. So, our offices are invisible. So, really, what we talk about the things that are slightly deeper about working for yourself. Like not about like the ins and outs or processes or any of that, but more about like the motivations or fears and emotions and that where we, 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 we cry and we shed a single tear at the end of every episode <laughs> and that sort of thing. But really we just kind of take it wherever the show needs to go. Like I think the second last episode we did was debating who would win in a fight, vampires or zombies. <laughs> and that was the whole, that was over an hour of that. But yeah, so the podcast is really just Jason and I talking about the the like meaning and stuff behind the things we do and then sometimes complete non sequitur cuz it's fun. So you you've now gotten to, you know, near the end of experiencing this podcast. Would you say that my listeners would find some crossover material? 
Definitely, maybe not in the zombie vampire episode. But if you're I into that, that yet, but yeah, <clears throat> yeah. But so there's a lot of the, yeah, there's a lot of good things. We did an episode on bullying. We've done an episode on like fear. We've done an episode on quitting. So a lot of the things are it's just things that people like us think about. So if you're kind of interested in the the motivations and that behind it, then yeah, it may be a podcast worth checking out. Awesome. Well, the, the people follow this show because it's all over the place. You know, beyond the to-do list is all about yeah. doing, you know, effective and efficient, like productivity people talk about, but also ta- doing work with meaning and purpose, like yeah. we like we talked about. Yeah. So I think they'll find something there for everyone. And, and you're into season two. You're doing it. You're even doing that in seasonal, uh, you know, output. Yeah, we didn't want to do it every week for Infinity because both of us have a lot of things going on and both of us kind of like to work on like a thing at a time. So it ended up working out well that, and both of our schedules are kind of crazy. <clears throat> so doing 12 episode seasons before seasons became the rage in podcasting, right. we didn't even, we didn't even know we were hitting on a trend. We just, ha- <laughs> we just happened to <laughs> randomly hit on that trend and it worked out. And even like, we don't even have sponsors for our podcast. Now we're selling a bundle of awesome instead to support the show because again, I like to keep my income stream separate. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to do podcasting. Let's see if I can make money doing podcasting. And it ended up selling the bundle of awesome. Um, worked out a lot better than any sponsor, any sane sponsor would pay us <laughs> to sponsor our <laughs> show. So it's, yeah, so it's done fairly well. We just like to do things. And that's why I like Jason. He's all for doing things that people have never tried that is totally out of the box. That's just kind of like, an experiment, so it's just like I don't know if this is going to work or fail. Let's see. Yeah, and we'll do it. Well, Paul, it's been a bundle of awesome to talk with yes. you. Let's pimp out some of your stuff. What are some of your favorite things, and where are the best places for you for them people to find you online? So the best place to find, unless you like sarcasm, I think I tweeted that yesterday. Sarcasm is my social media strategy. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter, but whatever. I don't say anything useful there. The best place to kind of get to know what I do and see if it's for you is my mailing list. And it's called the Sunday Dispatches. Mm-hmm. If you go to pjrvs.com, um, it's on every page to sign up. It's free. It's just a weekly newsletter. I send it out uh, Sunday mornings, every single Sunday. And if you're into that, you'll see the odd product that I make um, promoted there. But mostly it's just me telling stories um, once a week to anybody that listens. And that, that's the best place. I don't really care about promoting any of my products other than that. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. So P-J-R-V-S? Yes, dot com. com. Or just Google Paul Jarvis. I'm the whole first page, I think. Other than there's this cricketer in the UK that may still be on the front page. But if you just Google Paul Jarvis, oh, yeah. I- I'm that I'm what comes up yep. for every spot. I I'm, think I'm a football player in, in uh, Google too, but uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I have awesome. a British, I have a British name. So a cricketer <laughs> obviously <laughs> comes up. Nice. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. Cheers, Eric. I appreciate it. And I had a lot of fun. Thanks again to Paul for stopping by and talking with me about creativity and work and lots of other fun stuff. Thank you again for listening. Make sure to go try out Doodle to take the stress out of scheduling those meetings. You can try it for free. Head on over to beyondthetodolist.com slash doodle. I haven't asked in a while, so I will. If you are enjoying this podcast and you would like to help get the word out about it, tweet about it, Facebook about it, tell your friends, but especially go over to beyondthetodolist.com slash iTunes and please leave a rating or a review. Whatever you think it's worth, it would be greatly appreciated. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you next episode.
Beyond the To Do List is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award winning and award nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, delve into science fiction and philosophy, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.